Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Sure glad to have you with us today. Hey, we've got something here from one of our patrons asking us a question about a, a PRS rifle. Last season, I decided to try hunting with the only gun I had, a 22-pound PRS rifle. <laughs> Precision Rifle Series rifle is what that is, or the ones that they use for really long-range target shooting games that they play. Real popular sport. Teaches you a lot about ballistics and bullet performance and trajectories, I tell you. At any rate, this is Mr. Bond, one of our patrons who used a 22-pound one for hunting last year. Um, it, he says, it was awful. <laughs> I can believe you. Because of the political situation in Washington, I purchased an M1 Garand. A lot of people would call that the Garand. I understand Mr. Garand of the M1 Garand military rifle from World War II was pronounced Garand. How do you like that? I purchased an M1 Garand, and I have this idea of hunting with it out to 150 yards max. Uh, I picked up um, 150 grain nozzle Acubon bullets, but no primers or brass yet. Powders, 4895 and 4064 are nearly impossible to come across. What is an alternative powder to safely run that round out to about 2,700 feet per second? And can I use 150 grain hollow point boat tail bullets to dial in a velocity and a powder charge while not using projectiles that cost over a dollar each? <laughs> This is a, some good points here Mr. Bond is bringing up. You do not have to use your expensive hunting bullets when you're developing your loads and practicing and training and zeroing your rifle and all that other stuff. I will quite often use inexpensive bullets to get things going. But I do recommend that you use your expensive hunting bullets in your final tuning for that particular load and its impact point, how you're zeroing your rifle and all the rest of it. But yeah, while you're developing your, your loads and your pressures and stuff, you can work with these less expensive bullets. But then, once again, the bullet itself can, de can change the pressure. Uh, your chamber pressures can change based on the bullet's construction, uh, whether it's harder or softer, whether it has more or less uh, zinc in the gilding metal. Uh, different pro properties of that bullet can change its friction in the barrel. So you don't want to develop a peak pressure load with one bullet and then swap out bullets using the same powders, primers, and, and that's just asking for trouble. So do back off a little bit. You'll have a good firm idea of um, that particular bullet weight and the powders and what you're going to be getting for per performance, but then back it off a grain or two and start working your way up again, watching for those pressure signs, because that could change with your hunting bullet. Other than that, though, uh, the powders that I would recommend is I always recommend going to the manuals. Gosh, all the powder manufacturers and bullet makers have print manuals with all of the recipes for the different loads and such. Some of them even put out free magazine format annuals. I know Hodgson does that. And most of them will even have this data online. So it is not hard to find. And those people have done a lot more research than I ever will on which particular powders to use with which bullets, et cetera, et cetera. So I always recommend that. But as I told Bond here, the uh, powders that I would look at that, are, that have a real similar burning rate, that's what you want to look at, a slow burning powder versus a fast burning powder. And if you know what you're getting for a 4895 powder, that's a Hodgson 4895, I assume, um, similar burning rate powders would be the Varget Reloader 15, Big Game Winchester 760, and Hodgden 4350. They're all right close, so you can work with those. But again, ideally, go to the Hodgden website and or some of the loading manuals. Get your data there because they have done extensive research with that stuff. All right, let's see what we've got here from the team on the computer. First up is... Uh, someone correcting me, I believe. This is from Honey Badger. I think we've had Honey Badger on before. Double base and especially ball powders are notorious for poor functioning at sub-freezing temperatures. Stick with single base powders for those conditions and add magnum primers for sub-zero temperatures. Yeah, that's not bad advice. Um, 
Single based powders versus double base work like this. In smokeless powders, a single base means nitrocellulose. That's the gunpowder, nitrocellulose. Double base means that they add some nitroglycerin to it. And the upshot of that is you get about 20 to 50, no, 20 to 15 to 20 percent more power out of that. It has higher energy levels because of the uh, nitroglycerin. But it's a little harder to ignite. But remember, right, the burning temperature of the single base is around 4,600 Fahrenheit and uh, closer to 5,200 or so with the double. So, yeah, you've got to get it hotter before it ignites. And that's why it's good to use the, uh, the magnum primer. Magnum primers burn hotter, kick out a hotter flame to ignite those more difficult to ignite powders. They're generally recommended when you have a lot of bulky stick powders in the big magnum cartridges, but for, for sub-zero temperatures, not a bad idea at all there, Honey Badger. So good one. Thanks for the uh, backup on that and the extra advice. That's what we're hoping for from folks is I always say we're helping one another out here. I don't have all the answers, but by golly, by the time we get all that synergy and extra energy in from our viewers and listeners, we come up with the right answers. All right. Our list here starts with Billy from Georgia, who asks about bullets for the seven millimeter Magnum. I assume it's Remington Magnum. This is, this is a shorthand that so many people use. They say, hey, my seven mag, what do you recommend for a powder or a bullet? Well, which seven mag are you talking about? <laughs> there are so many of them now. But I assume that most people are referencing the old standard, which is the seven millimeter Remington Magnum. Um, and uh, the best bullets for that depends on what you're shooting, what velocities you're using, and um, whether or not you're using hand loads or factory loads. Factory loaded ammunition in 7 rem mag is down a lot in recent years. Don't know exactly why, but when it first came out, they were pushing it a lot faster than they do now. It's probably down 100 to 200 feet per second from its early peak. So your factory loads are not going to be quite as fast as safe hand loads. Um, and that would change to a degree the bullet that you might want to use. Also, at what distance do you expect that bullet to land on target? Um, an elk at 50 yards is a heck of a different proposition than an elk at 300 yards. So the bullet is soft and going to expand rapidly because of the high energies at close range. You're starting off with 3,000, 3,100 feet per second, maybe 3,200 feet per second, depending on the bullet weight. And uh, by the time you get to 300 yards, 400 yards, you've lost a lot of that velocity and thus energy. So the bullet doesn't strike as violently, doesn't expand as much. But up close at 50 yards could come apart if it's not built stoutly enough. So you really do need to consider the bullets and what your anticipated impact distances are. I think it's a safe bet in the 7 rem mag to start with a 150 grain bullet. I've used that a lot for deer and elk. And if you go with a harder bullet in the 150s, you can get plenty of penetration and be really effective on elk and even moose. Um, but if you want a little more energy on target, which a lot of people like, um, go to the 160s or the 168s or even the 175s for really deep penetration. And then, of course, if you're looking for the ultimate in penetration with a 175, you go to a harder bullet as well, meaning one of the controlled expansion bullets. And that could be any of the copper bullets like the Barnes and the Hammers and the Cutting Edge and the Badlands Precision and all of these great copper bullets or one of the um, bonded lead core bullets and or the partition style. They're all designed to open at certain impact velocities so study those bullets and figure it out for yourself. What is your anticipated impact energy level and what bullet is going to match up with that and how much mass do you need to penetrate to reach the vitals? So uh, that's the best I can tell you without specifying an exact bullet. I hate to do that because so many people love one bullet over another and and it's just not fair to say this bullet's never any good because it is. And it's never fair to say this bullet's always the perfect bullet because sometimes it isn't. You have to make up your own mind on that. But as a general rule, controlled expansion for deeper penetration, a little softer bullet for 
uh, more expansion and less penetration and or a distant target. When your energy levels drop, then you want a little bit softer bullet that will open more easily at a, at a lower impact velocity. All right. That was a good question, Billy. Now, Dale out of South Carolina wants to know this. I've been deer hunting with a Ruger 77 and 6.5 by 55 for 30 years. Is the 6555 just as good or even better than the 65 Creedmoor? It has worked phenomenally well for me. <laughs> well, I think you've answered your own question there, Dale. Um, but yeah, it, it is. The 6.5 Creedmoor has higher MAP, meaning maximum average pressure. The chamber pressure is higher. And that and allows those bullets to go a little bit faster well, with about the same powder or a little bit less. But the 6.5 suite, of course, has been around since 1892, I believe. And it is a well-proven round. Um, it's probably loaded down 100 feet per second slower than most of the factory 6.5 Creedmoor loads these days. But hand loaders will crank it up. In modern rifles with modern steels, fully strong, they can easily take a little bit more pressure. And the Europeans actually load their ammo to higher pressures than the U.S. does. So um, you can do a little better with your hand loads. But whether or not 100 feet per second makes a difference on hunting, I really don't think it does. The animal doesn't know if it got hit with 100 foot pounds, more or less energy. Um, and the, the trick with energy is the bullet needs to penetrate to the vitals and destroy those vitals. It's usually hemorrhaging. That's where, what we're after. So as long as the bullet has enough energy to punch through the hair and the hide and the muscle and some bones if they hit it, and then the vitals, the heart and the lungs, the liver, whatever vital organs you're hitting, You've done the damage. More energy really doesn't make any difference. I have said before, if you have a bullet that has just enough energy to do, do all that damage and then lodge against the elastic hide on the other side of the animal, a lot of people think that is absolutely perfect because all of the energy was, was put into that animal to do destruction. Well, the destruction was from the bullet tearing those tissues and getting to that point, And then it stopped because it had just enough energy to get there. So let's say your next bullet is going faster and it does all of the same damage, but it punches through the hide. And then you say, well, you wasted the energy. No, you had to use the exact same amount of energy to damage all those tissues. You just happen to have a little bit more to go out. So where was it wasted? You've done the damage. And then again, you can consider bow hunting. And the bow hunters take animals with almost no energy in their projectiles. Yes, they're very sharp and they cut maybe a little more effectively in a bullet. But when you think of the hemorrhaging that's caused by a bullet, when you open that chest cavity and there's all that blood, obviously there was hemorrhaging and that's what killed that animal. Unless you strike the nervous system, the central nervous system, you're not necessarily going to get lights out by just having more power. I've tried it again and again and again. And no matter how far up the magnum scale I went with those perfect chest shots, I did not see more dramatic instant demise on a consistent basis than with lower impact bullets. It was always pretty much a hemorrhaging issue, even when I got up into the 50 calibers. So that's my take on uh, that stuff. So your 6.5 five by 55, I think will just run right there with the 6.5 Creedmoor. You just won't be as cool. <laughs> Here's somebody from Washington, and uh, hey, I don't know if his name's Hunter, but that's the title he's using. Hunter says, Ron, please make a Hunt Honest Shoot Straight Window Decal. Oh, there's an idea. That's kind of cool idea. I like that, Hunter. The only thing that could make my truck better is RSO merch. <laughs> As a young hunter, I absolutely love your show and I listen to your podcast every chance I get. Have you ever done any Eastern Washington hunts? If so, where would you recommend? Well, I thank you so much for that, Hunter. That has just made my day there. I really like it that the young hunters are not only out there, but really interested in this whole project, hunting in the outdoors. Uh, we need young people to pick up the mantle and carry on. 
you know, the previous generations did a wonderful job of restoring wildlife in this country and establishing hunting regulations and seasons and all the biology that went into this. We have got an incredible record to stand on as conservation hunters, but we need the younger generation to step up and take over because as years go by, we lose more and more habitat to all the usual things. And it becomes ever more critical to really keep your thumb on the, the pulse of what's going on with wildlife and wildlife management. We're going to lose our hunting if we don't have places to hunt and wildlife to hunt. It all comes down to having the habitat. So I'm really glad to hear from young hunters like Hunter here. Um, now, to answer your questions, Hunter, yes, I have done a little Eastern Washington hunting. I actually used to live close to the border of East, Eastern Washington and North Idaho. I hunted pheasants over there and uh, in quail all over by the four, uh, what did they call those four towns over there? The Quad Cities. Did some fun quail hunting over there. And I've done a little bit of um, whitetail hunting south of Spokane. In the Palouse country and then those canyons that run through there. But I really can't recommend where to go because I was on private property at the time. Um, that's one of the issues with Eastern Washington is there's a lot of it is private property. But I also hunted up, knew there might have been some public property up there. It's just on the south side of the Columbia River up um, by, whoa, what would have been, close to Bonneville Dam. But then again, that was private land, but I think there was some BLM land in there. You might want to check Eastern Washington. There's a lot of dry country there with those big canyons, that wheat country, and some of it is rocky and rough and they're not able to farm it. It might be some chunks of BLM ground up there. I don't remember. It's been many years since I was up there doing that, but they had some pretty nice mule deer up there. And then, of course, you get the whitetail up in the pines. It's something that a lot of people don't know that there are whitetail in northern Idaho and northeast Washington, and some pretty good ones, but they blend into the mule deer when you get out into the drier places. Yeah, you've got some good potential around there. Um, I hear from a lot of folks that the Washington Department of Game and Fish, or whatever they call themselves, is not doing all that good of a job. I don't know if this is accurate or just grousing, but I hear it often enough, and you never really hear that Washington State is cranking out the kind of quality animals say that Idaho or Utah do. You know, the really big mule, deer, the really big elk. It always seems like they're fairly scrawny and people complain that they over harvest or they're just not, I don't know what it is, but you might want to look into that. Uh, a lot of times you just need, somebody needs to shake the bushes <laughs> and get things settled out in places like that. We just need to pay attention. I am not for sportsmen constantly haranguing fish and game departments and second, second guessing biologists and stuff, but we do need to hold our um, elected officials and our hired bureaucrats feet to the fire sometimes because corruption is nothing new. It happens. I think we've done a really good job of keeping it out of fish and game regulations for quite a long time. Um, back in the bad old days when it was all political, they used to appoint just anybody to run the fish and game commissions. And then it was licenses handed out to my buddies and seasons longer than they ought to be. And we fixed most of that stuff, but you know, still things can go off the rails from time to time. So it's, it's worth our time to pay attention. All right. Now, Hey, we're keeping it close to home here back in Idaho with someone named Steve. Most of us hunt with firearms and calibers. Our parents used when we can't leave good enough alone. What would be a good starting point to explore other caliber options? So many choices and options. It makes my head spin. <laughs> That is an excellent point, Steve. Yes, most of us do use dad's rifle or Uncle Jim's or grandpa's or grandma's or somebody's because, well, there they are, you know. Um, and after we've really gotten involved, like most young people, we think we know better than the old folks. <laughs> and sometimes we do. Sometimes we don't. But there's also newness and trend, uh, tradition. You know, you get older and you get set in your ways because, well, the old 30 odd six has always worked for me. Why should I bother trying anything else? I can understand that. But uh, if you're a young person, you want the latest and the greatest, you're going to probably snoop around. And then you've got the problem you're facing right here. There's so many choices. <laughs> How do you break this stuff down? Gosh, there's so many ways to consider it. One, of course, is just pragmatic considerations like 
how easy is it to find a rifle chambered for that particular cartridge? And how about the ammunition? Is it accessible? Are there a lot of options? And what are the costs of it? Now, if you're a real diehard gun nut, you're not really going to care that much. You're probably going to get into hand loading and then you can make any ammunition you want. So you don't have to worry about what they're selling on the shelves necessarily. Then you're going to start to think more about the performance. So that's the other way to look at it. How much performance do I need or think I need or just plain want? When I was younger, I wanted the fastest, flattest shooting anything in any caliber just because I was young and I wanted the fastest. My cars went a lot faster in those days too. So you've got to balance all that stuff. Now, to figure out how fast you want to go and or need to go, you need to balance that against other ballistic realities like, are you going to burn your barrel out? How much powder are you going to burn? How much expense is it going to be to have this faster cartridge? Do you really need it for what you're going to do? I mean, even the the hunters obviously wanted really fast bullets back in the day because we didn't have laser range finders. So if we saw a mule deer way out there, we'd have to scratch our heads and pretend there's so many football fields between us and them and decide whether or not we could make that shot, knowing our drops and drifts and stuff. Gosh, it was tough, so we'd want to get closer. Well, one way to get closer was to have a faster bullet because it would fly flatter, reach farther before it fell under the animal if we misjudged the range by 20 to 50 yards. Having a faster magnum cartridge could make up that difference. Nowadays, it doesn't matter as much. You laser range find them at 377 yards and you check your ballistic charts and whatnot. You know just how high to hold over or dial your turrets or select your line in the scope, whatever you're doing. So really it's not all that important to have that super high velocity. So maybe you don't want the recoil and or the expense of the magnums. You can get away with a non-magnum. These are all the things that you're going to have the fun of researching and discovering for yourself. You know, you can listen to guys like me talk about them, but then try to remember it all. It'll give you some incentive and some general ideas. And then you've got to start going to the paperwork. You've got to look at the numbers and do the comparisons. That's why I like to put a lot of my ballistic charts and trajectory comparison charts in my blogs on different cartridge comparisons and stuff, because there you can take your time and look at it and study and run the numbers back and forth and up and down and really get a good comprehension of what you're looking at. And you can do the same with a ballistics calculator online. I heartily recommend everyone start using those. Just punch in a search for ballistic calculator and up will pop a whole bunch of free ones. Get on those and start studying them and learn how to input the data that you need to cough out the numbers that you need. And then you can start doing some really quick comparisons, cartridge to cartridge and bullet to bullet. And you'll find out really quickly what you think you're going to need or want by doing that. So the good question, Steve, welcome to the, uh, to our hunting world. We're glad to have you and thanks for your interest. This is from Canada. We're going up to Canada, our neighbors to the north, and Tom is asking us, I keep learning that the major target rifle competitions are now being held with 22 rimfire rifles. Could you please tell me if this is so, in which case uh, I'll need to purchase a 22 rimfire target rifle. My preference would then probably be the British 22 Rimfire Martini International 22 Rimfire Target Match Rifle. I don't know that one, but at Martini sounds like a, a match rifle. I've heard of those. Could you please tell me where I could find this in North America, Canada, or the USA? <laughs> no, I could not. I don't know where you would find that. And, I, and we don't sell guns here. We can't have anything to do with selling guns uh, and don't want to. Go to your gun dealer. Your, in, in the United States, it'd be your FFL dealer where they have all the controls and the background checks and everything else. Um, but as to who sells them, it's not what you would call a popular rifle. Not everybody in his dog has a Martini International 22. <laughs> Um, do I have access to the international emails and the rules and the championships? No, I don't have that either. I am not a target shooter. I know that the 22 long rifle, long range target shooting game is really popular. And I can understand why, because 22s are so inexpensive. I mean, sure, you can spend a few thousand dollars on a really tricked out target rifle, but the ammunition is a lot cheaper than shooting seven PRC all day. So folks are interested. Plus you don't need a thousand yards. 
And the equivalent with a 22 is like 300 yards. And you can just do a lot of fun stuff at 200 and even 100 yards with a 22. So you get to shoot a lot and you don't burn out your barrels. There's just a lot to recommend a 22. And of course, it trains you to be a better shooter. When you then move up to your center fires, you're going to have your trigger control figured out and all the rest of the technique that you need to be an effective shooter. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't tell you where to go find that particular rifle, but do some research. There's plenty of places that you can find out this stuff. But I'm glad you're interested in the whole program. There are a lot of U.S. gun makers now who are making some remarkably proficient and efficient 22 long rifle target rifles. You might want to search for those too. I'm not sure what this particular martini that you're asking for does uh, that ours don't, but I would I would tend to go with what is what has a great reputation for target accuracy. Personally, I have some sporting 22 rim fires, uh, specifically a 1022 Ruger target model, and that shoots. Gosh, it's probably shooting. I haven't worked with for a long time, but easily under MOA. Um, and then I have a couple of Kimber 22s, which I really love, little bold actions. And they will shoot. It, uh, I've got some 50-yard targets that are like 0.178 with five-shot groups. Crazy stuff like that. So there's incredible precision, even with the sporting rifles. I mean, those are my squirrel hunting rifles. So there's a lot of potential out there with other rifles you might want to look at. Appreciate that question there, Tom, and good luck finding that martini rifle. Okay, from upstate New York, someone calling him or herself Zebra. Not a lot of zebras in New York, but this is one. 160 grain bullets for the 6.5 PRC. Thoughts and opinions on loads. I have some Hornady 160 grains, and I'd like to try them, but I can't find loads for them. For anything in the 6.5 PRC over 150 grains. Yeah, well, it doesn't surprise me because I've never seen any data for something over 150 in it either. I am guessing you've got some old round noses, right? You didn't specify what that bullet was. But I know that Hornady used to make, maybe they still do, a 160 grain round nose bullet. Because those were pretty popular on a lot of the 6.5s from Europe. A lot of the military cartridges and uh, 6555 Swede, I think, started off with one. Or maybe there's with 156 grain. But a lot heavier than we're getting in today's 6.5s. But those old military rifles were also spun up with one in nine twist. So that's why they had the longer bullets. But remember, a 160 grain bullet with a blunt round nose is a lot shorter than probably a 150 grain boat tailed Secant Ojive High BC Modern Target Bullet. It's the length that changes your the need for your twist rate. So that's why I think they were able to sell those 160 grains for loading in pretty much any 1 and 9 twist 6.5. And it was probably stabilizing the old 264 Win Mag, even though I think that had a 1 in 10 twist because it had the velocity to help speed things up. At any rate, um, data for that on the 6.5, I just don't know where you would find it. Um, you might want to call, well, either Hornady or Hodgson Powders. Hodgson Powder might have some data from back in the day, and you might have to extrapolate and consider the volume of the 6.5 PRC versus the volume of something else that was similar to it, like the six, the 264 Win Mag, and uh, then start low and work your way up. Um, but I would call Hornady on that one. Those guys will surely have the information you need. But yeah, don't just grab the 150 data and start loading. You've got uh, 10 more grains of weight there in that bullet. You're going to have to probably go to a slower burning powder. And then, as I say, start with a lower starting load and then gradually work your way up, watching for all of the pressure signs. And of course, the pressure signs are sticky bolt lift. Can't just absolutely rely on that, but it's a good initial indicator. Um, some guys will report that they can, it just sounds louder, maybe has a little bit more recoil. That's getting to be <laughs> pretty subjective. But once you've got that case out, look at the primer. And if it looks like it's been flattened out, that suggests really high pressures internally. And the, the primer's metal actually flowed to fill that little bit of a groove that you see between the primer and the case head. And that's all flattened out from that excess pressure. That's one signal. There's also a crater around the rim where the firing pin struck 
It suggests that the it was so hot and so much pressure that it flowed around it and made a rim out of that priming primer uh, case material. And then, of course, uh, excessive stretching and or diameter of the case actually increases. You might want to use a micrometer to measure that at the head. So that's what I can tell you about the 160. Again, you know, your best re- go to go to Hornady and get it from the right from the horse's mouth. Those folks should know for you. All right, this is from oh, back to Idaho again. Always fun to hear my fellow Idahonians. This is Poe. Ron, I uh, live in wonderful country with a lot of game and a lot of bears. I often hunt for deer and elk in thicker brush, and I'm looking for a lever action for my closer range hunts. I might be asking a lot, but do you have any suggestions on a cartridge that I can carry for bear protection but won't destroy my whitetail? <laughs> 35 Remington? 4570 should i get a 3030 or something i haven't considered thanks yeah that's a good one uh you have a lot of great choices in fact i'm just working on a video for my regular channel on some 35s i want to highlight the 358 winchester which not a lot of people know about but it's really quite a remarkable little short action cartridge and it's much more powerful than the 35 remington 35 remington is not bad but I wouldn't be my first pick. I'd want a little more horsepower, and I'm going to get it out of that 358. Uh, another Oldie Goldie was a 348 Winchester. That was only available in the lever action model 71. That was the 1886 Winchester, big, strong, heavy lever action chambered for the 4570. They modernized it a little bit, made it wonderfully slick, called it the model 71, and only chambered it in 348 Winchester. It shot a 0.348 inch diameter bullet. Not a 358. Not very many rounds are a 348. Um, and it was known as kind of the brush cartridge for elk and black bears and maybe even grizzlies back in the day. Now, this thing only came out in, gosh, when did they come out with that thing? The 1930s, I believe, 1935-ish or somewhere in there. But it kind of went away when they came out with that 358 Winchester. Even though it's a smaller cartridge, it drives your bullets faster by about 200 feet per second or so so those are all worth considering but there's not that many rifles chambered for them anymore especially not that 358 unfortunately you might find it in a browning lever action the blr it does not have the tube fed magazine so you've got a vertical stack magazine meaning you can use more efficient pointed bullets and that's part of the reason the 358 does so well and it might be chambered in, should be chambered in anyway, from my estimation, some of the Henry rifles, that long ranger now that um, also has the vertical stack magazine. That would be a good fit. Boy, I would hardly recommend that thing. Um, another option might be a 35 Whalen in the old model 95 Winchester lever action because that one had a vertical stack magazine as well. But you don't have to have sharply tipped bullets for short range work like that you know you're on the right track here with your 35 remington and or 30 30 and those two really give a pretty much similar energy delivery down range and everything even though there's different calibers the 4570 is a really fine option for having a bigger heavier bear stopping kind of bullet um i can get behind that and if you want to improve its performance on whitetail without blowing them up you're not gonna lose a lot of meat with that Uh, especially if you use a harder bullet and a heavier bullet. The commercial loads are going to be 300 grain and fairly weak, maybe 1,800 to 1,900 feet per second. That's all the velocity you're going to get out because they have to keep the pressures low for the old rifles, the trapdoor Springfields, which are pretty weak. You don't want to blow those up. But if you're shooting, say, an 1895 uh, Marlin lever action rifle, those are stronger and can take more pressures. And the hand-loading manuals will give data for the two. And they'll say, you know, keep it, keep it light and low for the trapdoor Springfield rifles. Get into that Marlin, and now you can crank it up maybe 200 feet per second faster, get more energy out of it, start to shoot those 400, 405 grain bullets instead of the 300 grain bullets. And you've got some penetration potential, which would you'd like that on a charging bear. Not that black bears charge that often, but when they do, you want to be able to protect yourself. And then your final option is the really high pressure where they push it up to almost the equivalent of 450 Marlin, which is not a bad option either. But that you almost have to have a single shot rifle like a Ruger number one 
really, really strong because they push the pressures way up on that particular load. So I'm thinking you're going to be looking at a lever action like the 86 Winchester that comes chambered into 4570, as well as the Marlin. I'm sure Henry has one. Those are all modern, strong lever actions that can take the higher pressures. Finding the ammunition on the shelves is a little more challenging. You have to really look carefully because some of these uh, ammo makers will make at the higher pressure loads and very specifically say four modern rifles only, et cetera, et cetera. So watch for that. But that's probably what you would really want for the ultimate safety uh, in case of a bear attack. Personally, I don't worry too much about bear attacks because in the 55 some years I've been prowling the wildernesses around the world where there are plenty of bears, including brown bears and grizzlies up in the North country. I have never been threatened by one. I mean, I've sometimes had them try to crawl into the fishing boat with us, but they were after the fish, not us. And they really weren't that aggressive and around camps and stuff. I had them sniffing around, but not threatening us in any way. But then again, every year there's one or two people who are mauled by a grizzly somewhere around Yellowstone. So yeah, I can't, can't blame anybody for being extra cautious about it. I just tend to take whatever deer round I'm hunting with and put a really heavy stout bullet in there if I think I'm going to need it for bear protection. I generally don't even hunt with a round in my chamber when I'm deer hunting or even elk hunting, unless I'm just sure I'm going to be up on one in, at any instant. But normally when I'm hiking around and glassing and looking for my game, I don't need a round in the magazine because just that quickly I've chambered a round. But if I think there's a bear around or an elk behind a bush, I'm going to load up. So it might be a smart move to have your bear load in, in the chamber ready to go. If you think you're in a dangerous situation or you just think a oh, grizzly could pop up anywhere at any time. If you've got a 308, 708, 270, anything, get the heaviest, hardest bullets you can in that thing. And it is going to have plenty of penetration for a bear. It all comes down to hitting them in the right place anyway. It doesn't matter if you have a, a 50 BMG. If you don't hit the central nervous system or break down the major locomotive bones, you're not going to stop that bear. There have just been too many bears and other dangerous game animals that have been hammered with big, heavy bullets from 50 caliber cartridges of all kinds that do not stop, even though they call them stopping cartridges or stopping rifles. You've got to hit the right place. Eventually, you're going to let the air out of them. They're going to hemorrhage and expire, but they can do a lot of damage to you before that happens, unless you hit the brain or the spine. And in that case, that hard bullet from a 308 or a 270 is going to do the job. So you just might want to consider that. Whatever your hunting white hills with, get yourself a particular bear load to carry at the top of your magazine or in the chamber. And then I think you're going to do just fine. There's a, a good, good question there, Poe, and that's something that we can all spend a lot of time thinking about. But however you choose to do it, I wish you a good luck and no close encounters with bear of the wrong kind. <laughs> And that looks like all of the questions and corrections for the day. I didn't get corrected by too many people today or anybody, if I remember right. So <laughs> I must be getting better at this. Hey, I want to thank you guys once again for uh, paying attention to this podcast and give us the encouragement to continue. Please continue sending in your comments and your corrections. We always enjoy those. And we thank you for your attention. Until the next time, do hunt honest and shoot straight. Mm -hmm.